Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on the political fallout of COVID-19 in specific Latin American countries. My name is Aved Delgado. I am the Digital Marketing Director for America's Market Intelligence, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. So before we get started, I just want to give you a quick overview of sort of what to expect. Uh, one of the big things is that uh, constantly uh, we get questions during the webinar, and we try to address as many as possible. So you as an audience member can ask a question at any point in time in the webinar. The way to do it is if you look on your screen on the uh, on the black rectangle there to that panel you should be able to see an icon that says Q&A and when you click on that it'll bring up a window and you can write in your question and we'll get it in at uh, as soon as you send it and we'll address as many questions as we can at the end of the webinar so that's basically how that works we also will be asking you a couple of questions here and there basically poll questions that help us understand sort of what you're going through and what your thoughts are on some of the topics that we're going to be covering today we'll announce those when they come up and those are very simple that just basically you have a panel that comes up and you just pick the response that you seem is most appropriate you feel is most appropriate uh, on the panel itself and that's uh, basically how that works so the polls are also very straightforward um so uh, that's oh the another thing too is a question that we always get is uh, are the are the slides going to be available is the video of the webinar going to be available after the webinar so don't ask that one because it is. I answer it for you right now. It always is. We, we make sure that we send it to all the people who are registered uh, once the webinar concludes within about 24 to 48 hours afterwards. So please uh, uh, just know that that's going to be available and no problem there. All right, let's move on to the next thing. This is our legal notice that's coming up here. I'm not going to read it in its entirety because it's just too much to go through, but I think the important thing to understand here, the biggest takeaway, is that uh, our presenters are expressing their particular personal views, not necessarily the views of the organizations that they work for. And this also talks about some of the information that you'll see here today and how we've attempted to um, authenticate it and to verify it as much as possible and the liability issues therein. So take a look at that at your leisure. Um, and that basically covers that. So, so, let, so we don't lose any more time. I'm going to turn the floor now over to John Price, the Managing Director of AMI, so that he can start us off with the introductions. John. Thank you, Abel. Welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, for attending what is, I believe, our sixth webinar in the COVID series. Today, we're going to be talking about the political fallout of COVID-19. Um, it's interesting, the timing of this uh, is starting to show its relevancy, unity across the region for lockdowns, for quarantines, as the uh, optimal policy for dealing with COVID is starting to show cracks, uh, as we saw um, protests in Santiago de Chile very recently, as we've seen uh, pretty steadily over the last month in Brazil, and we're starting to see in Mexico. Um, so we invited just a, a very highly, highly qualified panel of experts uh, representing the three biggest markets, um, <clears throat> Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia to join us today. Before I get to introducing each of them, let me quickly review with you uh, who we are at AMI. Um, what we found in these webinars is a lot of people tune in for the first time and are unfamiliar with our company. We are a uh, market intelligence and advisory firm, and we work uh, across a number of verticals, all of them uh, specialized in Latin American and Car Caribbean markets. Um, so whether it's logistics, payments, consumer services, natural resources, which includes mining, uh, energy, and infrastructure, as well as the industrial sector and healthcare, are all areas where we maintain industry practices. And on the next slide, I'll explain briefly what it is exactly we do for our clients. Our clients come to us because they need to make a major market-facing decision. Do I enter a market or not? Do I launch a brand? Do I extend my brand? Do I buy a company or I divest from a company? Um, how do I optimize my marketing spend this year? Um, can I trust this business partner that I'm looking at uh, partnering with? These are the kinds of decisions that require intelligence and that intelligence is what we gather on their behalf, usually from customers and potential customers in the form of market research, analyzing the competition in the form of competitive intelligence, or understanding the business context, which is a combination of understanding the political environment, which is what we're talking about today, the regulatory environment, as well as the economic environment. If you understand what's going on in those three areas outside of your company, chances are you will make solid business decisions. And that's the basis of, of uh, or the, essentially what we provide as a service. 
on the next slide. Um, these are some of the, the companies that we've worked for over the, over the last uh, several years. Um, familiar brands to, to most of you. Some of them are quite specific to the region. Now the next slide. And let me just quickly um, tell you about what we've, the pivot we've made as a <clears throat> consulting firm since the onset of COVID-19. We sat down as a group of consultants on March 18th, and we said to ourselves, you know, what do our clients need from us right now? Because a lot of our, a lot of the decisions that they might take and require our intelligence relate to the expansion of their business. Well, many businesses right now are not expanding. Some are but most are not, let's be, let's be honest. So we said, okay, what can we do to remain relevant? And we decided to, on a, a number of initiatives, including this webinar and others, where we keep uh, an audience, a broad audience of our clients and others informed around what's going on in their sector, or more broadly in webinars like this, what's going on in the political and economic environment. Trying to give them some foresight as to what to expect in the region in the next couple of months or even up to a couple of years. We also have weekly coffee chats organized around our industry practices um, where our practice leaders sit down and engage in an informal discussion one hour per week. And that's brought quite a nice community together of companies. It's non-commercial in, in nature. It's really about sharing best practices, sharing observations, et cetera. Um, where, where consultants, or sorry, where clients continue to hire us uh, is things like helping them recalibrate their business plans. Most of our clients have to submit business plans to headquarters if they're Latin American division or if they're a national division uh, to regional or, or global divisions. And of course, any plans that they put together at the end of last year are now frankly useless and they need to be redrafted. Um, a lot of companies hire us to keep track of what's going on in their industry, what's going on with their com competition, with the regulatory environment. This is a very dynamic um, situation which we find ourselves, and there's a lot of risks and some opportunities that are um, emerging every day. And to keep an entire organization appraised of that, it's useful to have somebody monitoring that. We're also, because of the success of our webinars, being asked to organize webinars on behalf of others. So these are some of the things that we've been doing and that QR code on the right will take you to the web page where those services are ex uh, explained in greater detail. So with that, let me uh, ask my uh, uh, colleagues to turn on their cameras briefly and I'll uh, very quickly give you a little background on, on each of them. You've already met uh, Abel and myself. Uh, Roberto Salinas, if you are in Mexico, you certainly will recognize his name. He's been a staple on national television now for well over, close to two decades, I would say, Roberto. Um, he runs the Mexico Business Forum. He, is a, uh, he advises companies on strategic issues around the economy, around the political environment, the investment and climate. He's also a prolific um, writer, uh, publishing in, in, in both English and Spanish uh, in Mexico and around the world. Um, we have Tiago de Arago. Um, who uh, a typical jet setter splits his time between Washington, Brasilia, uh, Sao Paulo, and London. He works with a company called Arco Advice, which is a leading advisory um, uh, and, and risk firm that, that works with companies in the financial space, funds, uh, as well as specific strategic investors, helping them understand um, the, the working environment across Latin America as well as helping Brazilian companies understand uh, working environments around the world. And last but certainly not least, Sergio Guzman in Bogota, uh, the principal at Columbia Risk Analysis, uh, who specializes and has quite a career in risk analysis in Colombia, um, helping companies, but also advising governments uh, on operational risk, uh, on political risk. And he's also a prolific writer, both in Spanish and English. Uh, you may very well have read his material if you follow the region. So with that, um, we will come back to our panel in about 20 minutes in a QA. and a And um, as Abel pointed out, we invite you as an audience to submit your questions. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so presenting some trends and analysis that we have uh, taken upon ourselves 
to look at the <clears throat> both the health and economic impact of COVID-19 in Latin America, um, provide some uh, comparative numbers with the rest of the region. I think that if we draw our interpretation of this crisis strictly from day-to-day -day media, uh, we tend to get a, um, a rather skewed opinion of things. And I think it's always good to return to some basic numbers to understand the relevance of this uh, uh, pandemic and the relevance of the economic policies that are being put in place. So let's begin on the next slide. Let's begin uh, with a poll question, if the uh, if, uh, audience will do us a favor of telling us which country will be in the best economic condition one year from today. So this is looking forward, um, trying to understand how you feel about the economic conditions, which of course will be related to how these countries are dealing with the pandemic, both from a health uh, point of view and from an economic point of view. So we'll give you just a few more seconds to answer the poll. And as the uh, number of respondents slows down, we'll, we'll share those results. Okay. Uh, with about two-thirds of you voting, um, uh, Colombia and Chile are the clear sort of winners in terms of people forecasting. That's not surprising. Colombia is being lauded for its um, rather uh, quick and very strict response, and thus far, in terms of the number of deaths reported, quite successful tamping down of the quarantine. Chile, I think, uh, is lauded for its high level of testing low mortality rate, and of course, um, the quite uh, responsive fiscal and monetary um, policies that have been put in place. So thank you for that, everyone. Um, and let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. So you're all familiar with the, the graph on the right. This is the famous bending of the curve. It's interesting. Um, when uh, when the WHO, uh, the CDC, and other officials weighed in on best practices and policy, um, the whole notion of bending the curve was not to snuff out the virus, not to stop the virus, because epidemiologists assumed that was impossible, but it was designed to um, prevent healthcare systems from being overwhelmed so that the number of ICU beds would not be used more than, you know, demanded more than 100% of capacity, and people who were gravely ill from this could be treated. Um, on the left, I think, is more um, compelling data. This is the number of days since the number of deaths in each of these countries uh, recently doubled. So in South Korea, the number of deaths today is twice the number it was 54 days ago. At the other end of the extreme, El Salvador, the number of total deaths today is double what it was just 11 days ago. And as you can see, South Korea and Taiwan are two countries that um, it, from a regulatory standpoint are, pretty, are almost back to normal working conditions. That doesn't mean that consumers are yet uh, returning to their old habits out of fear they're not, but um, from a regulatory standard point, these are the two of the most open economies today. Italy, Germany <coughs> are uh, two countries that are opening up um, gradually, um, just in the last couple of weeks. The Dominican Republic, interestingly enough, um, has not had a particularly strict quarantine, but has had a relatively low level of contagion and, and relatively low level of mortality. And as uh, one of the experts I talked to last night told me, he said, it's not really because of anything we're doing. He figures it's because of the heat and humidity of the Dominican Republic climate that helps slow down uh, the transmission. And there's lots of evidence to support that notion. Panama, Uruguay, Sweden, USA, these are all countries that, um, you know, some would argue are not ready to open, others would argue are ready to open. 
Uh, and in fact, all of these countries are at different stages of opening. Argentina uh, probably would be the next country uh, from an epi epidemiology point of view to be able to open. Whether the government decides to or not, of course, it becomes more of a political decision. And as you can see, the remaining countries, um, they still have, from a purely epidemiology point of view, they still have time. They still have work to do before they can open. Now, whether they choose to open earlier because of political pressure, because of economic pressure, the very subject we're going to be talking about today remains to be seen. Let's go to the next slide. So a lot of a lot of press right now is uh, you know naming Brazil as the center of the um, or one of the centers of the global pandemic, and certainly um, there's no question that there is a sense in Brazil that they have lost control of the pandemic. That it's really at this point uh, there's no way of containing it. But I think we put together the table on the left to just point out to people the relativity of COVID versus other forms of mortality in their societies. Now, if you're in Belgium or Spain, the rate of death from COVID is greater than any other cause of death in those countries this year. Um, and certainly much greater than things like car crashes and homicide. But if you're in Brazil, uh, the rate of death in COVID is about one-tenth of what it is in Belgium thus far, that's important to note, and about one-tenth of the leading cause of mortality in Brazil, which is heart disease. Um, now, that's not to uh, diminish the importance of COVID, but it is to put it in another light that from the average Brazilian's point of view, this is not the greatest health risk that they face today in Brazil. Um, and, and heart disease and COVID are interesting to compare because they often <clears throat> inflict the very same vulnerable groups, whether it's uh, due to obesity or simply uh, older age, hypertension, et cetera. Um, but we wanted to just point this out because it's important when you're a European or an American uh, or North American or even an Asian looking upon Latin America and scratching your head as to why aren't people more concerned about this it's important to understand that these are countries that suffer for higher rates of mortality uh, in almost every cause of death. So it's, a, uh, it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, and this will also bear out when people are weighing the importance of COVID as a health crisis versus COVID as an economic crisis. Let's go on to the next slide. Another important thing to keep in mind is that um, <clears throat> Uh, we really don't have any kind of sense of the real number of cases out there. What we do know is that in countries that tend to have a higher percentage of their population tested, the mortality rate, in other words, the number of deaths versus the number of reported cases, seems to be much lower. And that's even the case here in Latin America, as you can see in the table. In the case of Chile, which has the highest rate of testing, they have the lowest mortality rate. In Mexico, that has the lowest rate of testing, has the highest mortality rate. Well, it's not that people in Mexico are much more vulnerable to this uh, virus than the Chileans are. It's just that in Mexico, they're completely unaware of how many real cases there are. And in fact, the Princess Cruz line, which has become a sort of small laboratory of um, understanding this virus, released data, there was data released yesterday that showed that <clears throat> About one in four people on the, uh, on the ship were infected. And of those, 57% um, showed no symptoms whatsoever. About 5% needed intensive, you know, serious uh, hospitalization. And 1.7% died. Now, the population of people on a cruise line is, uh, is, it tends to be older people. So when we translate that mortality rate of 1.7% to a general population of, say, a Brazil, United States, Mexico, Colombia, we get a, a real uh, mortality rate of about 0.5%. And this is, uh, we're seeing now more and more consensus around this idea that the true mortality rate is somewhere between 0.1%, which we've seen in some countries with high levels of testing, to as high as 1%. 
in, in older populations or more obese populations where there's greater level of vulnerability. So I think that's an important uh, lesson to learn um, as we look forward. And let's go to the next slide. Let's take the case of Chile, which has been uh, quite successful at its level of testing and tracing. And thus far, as of two days ago, had suffered 509 deaths because of COVID. Back in 2017, in what was a fairly strong seasonal flu around the world, where over 1.2 million people died worldwide from the flu that year, uh, in Chile, two and a half, sorry, 2.2 or 2,235 people perished from the flu. Um, now, if COVID um, were to run sort of uh, uncontrolled across the population and was to reach a sort of herd immunization at 60% of the population, which is a number we've heard frequently, and 0.1% of the people were to die from that, then the number who would perish in Chile from COVID-19 would be 11,469, a much bigger number than what have died so far. And therefore, the quarantines are certainly working. And if the mortality rate in, in Chile were to be as high as 1%, which is the higher end of, of most experts' range, then that would be over 100,000 deaths in Chile. So there's no question the quarantines are working, they're saving lives. The question then becomes at what cost? Now on the next slide, um, we wanna show you some numbers. Uh, this is a rather busy slide, but on the right-hand side, you see just how many people in terms of thousands of people would die from COVID-19 if it were allowed to run its course to herd immunization at different levels of mortality. On the left, you see some of the costs of quarantines. Um, 10 to 20% GDP drop could be the very much the toll this year. Unemployment rates of 15 to 30%. Millions of bankruptcies of small business. Definitely a worsening of the income gap already the most the worst income gap in the world, which is Latin America. Spikes in domestic violence. And also uh, one thing that's not listed here is people failing to get surgery and preventive care in hospitals. So that heart disease rate of death will actually go up because people are not getting intervening um, operations and such to help keep them alive. In the case of Chile, um, based upon what they've spent so far and what they've lost in terms of lost productivity, what is it costing to save each of those lives? Now, this is an awfully uh, morbid figure, but it is a figure nonetheless that policymakers have to keep in mind. If the mortality rate turns out to be as high as 1%, then the cost per life saved uh, at our estimate is about $250,000. If in fact the mortality rate is at the low end of the range that we're seeing, um, then the, the cost per life saved is closer to $3 million each. Now Chile is one of the few countries in Latin America that might actually be able to afford that. Other countries probably less so. And that uh, brings us to our discussion. Um, just uh, if you go to the next slide, and if I could ask uh, our panelists to come uh, turn their, their mics on and their cameras on. Um, and uh, like I said, there is a, uh, they're starting to see divisions and uh, falling support for the lockdown measures in some of these markets. So the first question I'd like to ask each of you to answer, and <clears throat> perhaps Tiago, you could start us off, um, is, is, you know, how much public support is there in Brazil for government policies? And yours is probably the most colorful uh, uh, country to talk about. Um, and, and what kind, is that support waning? Um, and I realize it's a complex question in Brazil, but I'll leave that to you to answer. <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to talk with all of you. Uh, the situation in Brazil is very complex because uh, after all, we are a federative republic. So power is shared in a way that it's different from other Latin American countries. Um, the major decision making relies uh, with, with the governors and their ability to impose or restrict or uh, take away lockdowns and quarantines. 
at the end of the day, the president, he becomes mostly a major opinion maker in relation to the enforcement of quarantines and uh, the behavior of individuals of whether respecting that or not. Basically, this is what's creating mass confusion, because if you put an extra layer of political disputes between the president and specific governors, you have governors right now imposing uh, quarantines or imposing certain restrictions while at the same time the president defends otherwise. This creates mass confusion, but we are still in the face that the majority of the support is for uh, quarantines. However, people are becoming tired of that, particularly because the parcel of the population who are respecting the quarantines are blaming the individuals who are not for the extensive period of quarantines in Brazil. So uh, uh, a badly done or badly enforced quarantine and zero is the same thing. And this is part of the debate that we're having right now. Great. Um, Roberto, how, how, what's public support like uh, for the quarantines and specifically for government policy? Well, well uh, when, when Tiago was talking, I thought he was talking about Mexico, actually, <laughs> uh, because we have a very similar dynamic here. Uh, perhaps uh, even more paradoxical. Uh, there's been a much more relaxed um, effort here in Mexico than the draconian lockdowns that you've seen uh, that you've seen elsewhere. And we're right at the beginning of the of the alleged uh, reopening stages, where this has been divided in, into four uh, in Mexico. We're beginning with those uh, municipalities. Uh, that have been labeled municipalities of hope, municipios de la esperanza, and that, that's a that's a beautiful characterization, <clears throat> which rings well politically. But clearly, these are these are municipalities where no testing has been done, or very very little testing has been done. So really, we're going into this reopening, not really knowing what the figures of the pandemic are. I think that. Uh, uh, the, the type of graphs that you showed before, John, would be extremely helpful to many of our government politicians that seem bent on denying the realities of a pandemic that is upon them and that they're reporting something like 56,000 uh, uh, cases right now with 38,000 suspicious cases with 6,000 deaths. And already, uh, as many of you uh, may know, uh, El, El País in Spain, New York Times, Washington Post, uh, Wall Street Journal, and a report by the British uh, Sky News, uh, a, a TV report, came out saying that just by looking at the activity of Mexico City morgues, for instance, or of other morgues in the city and the fact that they're completely swamped, you can tell just by that anecdotal evidence that these figures are being tremendously underreported. Julio Frank, the, the, the dean of um, the president of the University of, of Miami, suggests that, uh, that we, may up, we may up to be a, a million Mexicans that, uh, that al already are infected or asymptomatic with, with COVID-19. But these figures are, uh, let's say, they offend the political sensibilities of the current czar, Hugo lopez Gatel, and they offend the, the politics and the stance of the government. There's clearly a, a uh, stance against testing, which um, only last week, three, uh, three of the um, worldwide tests have been approved by the local uh, agency called COFEPRIS, which is basically the sanitary agency that, uh, that, that gives permissions. So it's, it's, it's really a, a puzzling and befuddling situation uh, of, of what is happening in Mexico. And I fear that we're, we're, we're going into a hurricane or a tempest, not really knowing where the, where, the, where the path is as far as the pandemic. I do sympathize with the fact, uh, and, 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 this, and this perhaps is an unorthodox uh, point of view, that for many of those living in poverty and extreme poverty, and in view of the economic catastrophe that is, that is upon us in Mexico, I'll get back to that point later, that, that there may be no other option in some parts of the country than herd immunity, even though it's those rural populations that seem to be reacting against the fact that no strict lockdown has been uh, enforced. So that's, um, uh, that's a general characterization of the situation that we have right now, uh, not knowing where the pandemic is, is, is taking us and uh, waiting to see how the reopening of the economy, which is taking place this week, Hmm. will uh, will take us as well. Very interesting. Um, 
Sergio, uh, <coughs> Colombia is one of those countries uh, <coughs> referred to by Roberto as uh, having conducted very um, strict lockdowns. Um, and certainly, if one is to um, put faith in the, in the numbers that are reported, um, certainly has been quite effective. How is public support for those measures? Uh, are there cracks in that? What, how about political support for those measures? Absolutely. And, and I'd be remiss not to thank you, John, again for the invitation uh, to participate today. Uh, what I'm going to say is, may sound a little shocking, but much to his credit, President Duque takes the advice of scientists and has been well advised by his Minister of Health, Fernando Ruiz, who has a master's in public health and actually studied epidemiology. Uh, early on in this crisis, one of the things that uh, I recall he tweeted was, when I was in grad school, we did scenarios for imposing quarantines. Um, I never thought I'd have to implement one in my own country. And I think to Duque's credit and to Minister Ruiz's credit, they acted decisively and they acted early, not without uh, some uh, political questions arising as a result of that. I think there was quite a bit, like Tiago alluded to, um, op opponents of the, the government's measures early on, uh, proponents of even harder measures that, that in a way forced the government to take uh, some decisive action early on. And I think that that uh, divide between local governments and the national government, uh, we thought that as, as the crisis uh, continued, uh, these kind of shocks would, would become lower. Uh, but to our surprise, that, that hasn't happened, maybe naively so. Um, I will say President Duque's approval rating has increased uh, as a result of his response to COVID-19. Uh, I, would, I would posit that the laws of gravity apply to that as well uh, in, in some point in the near future. Uh, I think that there's support from the population regarding the, the lockdowns and the measures, because I think for the most part, people understand how serious um, this virus is and how easily contagious uh, it is. But at the same time, the informality rates uh, suggest that people are going to have to come out and make a living regardless of uh, the situation. And there is frustration in, in, in the fact that although the government has manifested that its uh, subsidy rollout has been successful, many people feel that the safety net doesn't apply to them. And so I uh, think uh, that this is one of the issues that will uh, open up the cracks, that will be taken advantage by uh, more populist um, leaders uh, going forward, and that will represent uh, a big problem for, for President Duque during the remainder of these two years, in addition to the already growing social unrest uh, before uh, COVID-19 crisis happened. Interesting. Um, we'll, we'll get to what the implications are around the next electoral cycle. Um, but uh, Tiago, to you, um, you know, Bolsonaro has been under tremendous pressure. Um, uh, there has been, I, my understanding is, uh, several different initiatives sent to Congress to have him impeached. They have not been acted upon thus far. But certainly, um, I imagine the broad congressional support that he had for, uh, particularly for Paulo Guedes' uh, reform agenda, um, must have been impacted by by this crisis. Can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of political support, um, beyond the public opinion, what sort of political support uh, Bolsonaro has uh, through his sort of coalition of like-minded parties um, in government? And what is this going to do to his ability to legislate things like the tax reform and other reforms that the business community has been waiting for in Brazil for an awfully long time? Well, uh, throughout 2019, we had basically a parallel government inside the Brazilian government, which was the kingdom of the Ministry of Economy. And why do I refer to it as a kingdom? Because at that particular, particular situation, 
uh, in the construction of this new administration, the Ministry of Finance combined with the Ministry of Trade, the Ministry of Budget, and also placed under the umbrella of Minister Gadis, the, the direct control over several other economic areas of the government, even the state-owned banks, uh, the central bank uh, president responds informally, uh, but in a continuous base to Gadis. So the creation of this kingdom allowed them to also develop a strategy of direct approach to the parliament, which didn't require the usual stop that traditional governments had done through the presidential palace. So what we've seen in 2019 is that the coalition was much more solid towards the measures that came from the Ministry of Economy, rather from the measures that came from the presidential palace. So that created a dysfunction that depending on the angle that you look at, the government was very efficient, but depending on a different angle, mainly on the political questions, the government was not efficient. So this led Bolsonaro to do what he does best, which is create a confrontational narrative in order to put popular pressure upon certain individuals uh, expecting that this could rearrange the configuration of power for him. The target at that time was the Speaker of the House, Rodrigo Maia, and through a series of uh, uh, expositions, President Bolsonaro blamed the Speaker of the House for specific losses that they had in the parliament. Uh, this created popular pressure against the Brazilian Congress, and this led to a disarrangement and a disorganization of an already disorganized allied base. And why disorganized? Because instead of creating an allied base, uh, trying to bring in parties together, uh, Bolsonaro, he attempted to do something different by creating an, an allied base, a base that fluctuated depending on the topics. Uh, at the end of the day, this worked, but the fluctuation increased in number in economic issues and decreased in number in other political issues. So the levels of defeat that Bolsonaro faced in Congress were mainly imposed by betrayals in his own allied base. Understanding this, Bolsonaro decided to make a move towards the centrist parties, which were demonized by him during the electoral campaign, when he blamed the centrist parties, which are very pragmatic and follow no direct or clear ideological path, for the historical evils of Brazilian politics. However, this group of individuals, they bring in a substantial number of congressmen that could basically shift the, 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 the stability and the solidity of this allied base inside the Congress. So the move from Bolsonaro was to create this belt of support inside the Congress, adding an extra layer of solidity through bringing in the centrist parties to the government. But there was a cost for that. There is a cost for that. And the cost is that the leaderships in the centrist parties, they want to be part of the decision-making process at the executive. So the cost will be the appointment of specific individuals from the centrist parties in key positions inside the executive. Naturally, this creates a backlash in public opinion, but on the other way, it brings the expected solidity uh, that President Bolsonaro wants. However, uh, this solidity, although loyal in the beginning, demands a constant construction that Bolsonaro throughout his career has proven that he has no experience in. During 30 years in Congress, Bolsonaro was never the leader of a party, the president of a committee, the rapporteur of a bill, or the leader of a caucus. So he was never in a position of working with convergence. Divergence was always his political strength. So right now what we see is that by bringing in the centrist parties, Bolsonaro hardly will face an impeachment. All he needs is 172 votes uh, to block any impeachment request inside the House of Representatives. With the composition of his old allied base plus the centrist parties, he has well over 220 votes uh, uh, members of the parliament, creating a structure that would protect him from an impeachment. However, this can shift and change depending on the volume of pressure that comes from the streets. 
because the composition for an impeachment is public pressure to a certain point that breaks out your allied base inside the Congress, plus a very clear and understood motive from the Brazilian society in order to wrap this up. You will never see an impeachment process uh, with a sound and good economic environment. But when we are facing the, the risk of an 8% uh, uh, fall in the GDP for this year, this will create an economic environment that could fuel in for public pressure in the streets and put more risk in the stability of the Allied base since Bolsonaro has no experience in maintaining this kind of convergence. Okay, quick follow-up. Um, if there's an ascendancy of those pragmatic centrist parties, um, where does Gede's reform agenda stand in this environment? Can he legislate in this environment or is everything sort of put on hold until next year? When, when will there be concrete movement on a couple of the very important pending reforms that certainly I can think of at least $60 billion of hedge fund money is sitting waiting, you know, to see what happens around those reforms? Exactly. Well, uh, under this new alliance, naturally, uh, he would have, he, he is currently smiling, and I spoke uh, with members of his team last night, that he's confident that with this solid alliance, as long as Bolsonaro is fulfilling uh, the, the promise of delivering certain positions in the, in the government to these centrist leaderships, they will deliver back the votes. However, the problem in 2020 is the calendar. You have the coronavirus, you have the municipal elections that could be delayed, but no more than two months. And around December, you will, will, we will see the movements for the election of the new Speaker of the House and new, the new President of the Senate, which in the case of the Speaker of the House will probably be one from the, the uh, centrist parties. So the composition of votes is looking favorable for the approval of uh, a tax reform, for example. However, the timing is not. When we look historically, the first and the third year of a Brazilian administration are usually the best years for the approval of structural measures. So 2021 can be the best year for that as long as the political environment delivers some sort of stability. And this is precisely the problem that the market looks in Brazil which is the instability generated by the political environment. So we were able to create two major political crises encapsulated inside one of the major uh, global crises of our generation. So this ability of generating crisis is what creates uncertainty uh, in the market, in the investors, and uh, in the ability of the government to deliver. Just a quick point, the risk of the centrist parties towards gadgets is the interference and part of the negotiation between the centrist parties and Bolsonaro leads to a point that Bolsonaro appoints leaderships of the centrist parties inside Gadget's kingdom. This is a risk because if this happens and it's natural for the centrist leaderships to want to occupy positions with high budgets, this could generate a sort of uh, interference that was similar to what Moro claimed that Bolsonaro was uh, doing when he was interfering in Moro's previous kingdom. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Roberto, um, AMLO came to power with unprecedented mandate at the Senate, the, the, the House level, as well as the presidency. Um, what has happened to his ability to legislate? Uh, where is his focus? And we have midterm elections coming up, uh, I guess, next year. Um, where, where, uh, where does the Morena party stand? Uh, what, is, what is the likelihood of their ability to hold on to their majorities, uh, in, uh, given, the, given the COVID-19? Roberto, there you go. Sorry, yes, I was muted. Uh, so many questions and, and very important questions, uh, John. Uh, first of all, we have to take into consideration that despite the uh, effects of the pandemic and the economic downturn in, uh, in Mexico, AMLO 
AMLO, not necessarily Morena, his party or his movement, uh, AMLO continues to hold rather high uh, ratings. Uh, some of us are actually surprised at these results. So depending, depending on, the, on the polls that you see, he still tends to command uh, 50 to 60% approval ratings, uh, given the circumstances right now. Now, there are those that feel, and I include myself in this camp, that there's going to be a very, very high political and popular price to pay for the absolute, um, for, for a political negligence that is almost demential at this point and not listening to anybody from his team, from his party, from his group of advisors or even the voices of uh, civil society in trying to adjust his policies to a, such an unprecedented crisis. And it's almost as if uh, COVID-19 is secondary in the face of the extremely toxic public policies. It seems like day after day, there's a, there's a taxonomy that is being developed of highly toxic public policies. Just last week, there was an effort to, um, there was an, an initiative by one of the regulatory, supposedly independent energy bodies that regulates the, the electricity, the recently opened electricity market to basically grant monopoly powers back to the Comisión Federal de Electricidad headed none other by Manuel Bartlett, whose son was recently awarded a very lucrative contact, contract uh, to sell to the uh, government hospitals, to the Eames hospitals, uh, ventilators at eight times the uh, cost unit price. So, I mean, those type of scandals, he seems to be immune to that. And he sort of dismisses them in the famous mañaneras, these daily press conferences that despite COVID, and despite the World Health Organization and despite the recommendations of his own Minister of Health, he continues to do with social distancing, but without masks and sometimes even saying, no, I don't need the gel to wash my hands and whatnot. I think, I believe this weekend, he's going to start traveling throughout Mexico again to try and promote tourism. Um, tourism is, is, is a very important source of uh, income in Mexico and has been absolutely decimated by this sudden stop in economic uh, activity. Uh, and the, the, the response from the government and from AMLO himself has been almost nonchalant. Who cares if they go broke? It's almost as if the image of the 1% of the fat cat who owns uh, the Four Seasons Hotel or the Fairmont Hotel or, or the Five Star Hotels. Well, what, what, what about those hotels that simply provide services for those who want to travel in different places like Merida, like Querétaro, like Puebla, uh, like Nayarit and uh, Colima and, and whatnot? Uh, if, if you let those fail, it's not just the investors that are going to lose their monies. It's all those productive chains that, that, that sustain or that were bred out of those investments originally. And of course, those that are employed by, by, uh, um, by these hotel chains. And that's just one specific sector in mind. So I believe if we generalize, when you're talking about a, a, a drop that has not been seen in Mexico's, a contraction that has not been seen since the Great Depression, 10 to 12%, the, the most pessimistic estimates uh, range from 12%, the most optim optimistic is 7%. When the president himself says that GDP no longer matters, that what we need is a new indicator to measure happiness and spiritual well-being, and he's developing this, 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 uh, 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 this, this, this indicator, um, that tells you very much about the type of um, the type of economic scenario uh, that we're going to be confronting, especially with small and medium-sized enterprises and with the informal economy. In other webinars uh, where we participated, John, recall that for emerging markets in general, uh, as Carmen Reinhardt, recently appointed uh, uh, vice president of the, of the uh, World Bank, has uh, said an author of This Time is Different, uh, uh, this time really is different. It's not the, your classic financial crisis of the last 800 years. This time it really is different where all of a sudden uh, you, you had a crisis emerging out of nowhere because of, the, uh, because of the pandemic. And that requires a tremendous amount of adaptability. Um, it, it requires help from the government. The fact that AMLO has not wanted to offer any type of fiscal uh, and, and monetary relief seems to suggest that he's sticking to these principles of austerity. But because of economic contraction, jet to GDP ratio is of course going to, <laughs> going to go sky high. So the, the results are the exact opposite of what he's doing. 
Now, there's a question that I was reading from the floor from the, from, uh, from the attendees uh, uh, suggesting, well, could I talk a little bit about this famous phrase that Lopez Obrador said that esta, esta crisis nos viene como anillo al dedo, right? Like it's, 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 it's on, it comes to us on a silver platter. And the idea was, I'm going to demonstrate that my way is the only way, COVID or not, COVID-19 or not. That type of Taliban-like, profoundly ideological thinking is going to weigh heavily, I think, on uh, political, um, on, on, on forthcoming political elections. My prediction is that he is the Morena, where there's tremendous infighting in Morena. The only thread that keeps Morena together is, is, uh, is AMLO. It's almost as if the Messiah with, with his devotees. But his devotees hate each other, and there's a, a lot of fighting as to who, a little bit like the way the PRI used to be back in the, in the days of the perfect dictatorship, but who gets to the top of the, uh, of, of the pyramid. And I think, I, I think uh, Morena will lose gubernatorial races, very important gubernatorial races. There's 16, I believe it's 16 of them in 2021, as well as the majority in Congress. Uh, I'll end with this on this point. No wonder Lopez Obrador wants to invoke emergency powers to seize full control of the budget for the remainder of his term, something mm -hmm. that has scared us a great deal here. And I'm actually quite surprised why the State Department or why our number one trading partner hasn't complained about expropriation of renewables, about what's going on with the budget, and, and, uh, and, and about other highly toxic public policy that is inconsistent with North American integration. Right. Quick follow-up, Roberto. Um, AMLO made a pledge early on in his sexenio that at the midway point, after three years, he would hold a plebiscite, a national plebiscite, um, you know, to ask people if they were willing to uh, keep him on for the rest of the sexenio, the rest of the six-year period. Um, I heard that he recently renewed that pledge. Um, so two questions. One is, what role might that pledge play? Um, and will it go forward with, will we have a plebiscite next year around his presidency as well as, like you say, the already um, uh, scripted um, midterm elections of the Senate and the House? And secondly, what's the op what are the opposition parties doing how effective, if at all, have they been in galvanizing some of the angst that's come out from people about AMLO's uh, reaction to COVID? Oh, those are two, two other great questions. On the plebiscite, uh, from, from a political point of view, it's, it's not, it has no legal, uh, no legal basis. So it would just be a popularity, a beauty contest, so to speak. Now, AMLO said that this would take place in 2022, and now he wants to put it in the 2021 ballot. I think that he thinks that his, that his, um, um, that his coattails will be able to help Morena right along in, in, uh, in 2021. But even so, again, this would be just a, a beauty contest with no real enforceable uh, uh, legal uh, consequences. Uh, besides, the plebiscites or the referendums that he's, that he's constructing have been sham referendums. Uh, the one to expel Constellation Brands, the, the, uh, the beer maker, uh, with $1.6 billion investment in, in Mexicali. Of course, the, 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 the tragic case of the, the uh, cancellation of the Mexico City Airport. These, these were all popular uh, consults, consultas populares, uh, referendums that were sham. They were based on 1% on or 2% of the population and uh, um, not coincidentally population controlled by Morena. Now the real, uh, the real story here is why hasn't there been a political voice or political leadership as you, as you well mentioned, uh, John, to emerge out of this in order to be able to stand in front. There are many voices that have emerged, but there's not a constituency or a series of personas, of political personas that have said enough and we need, we, we need to balance uh, we need to balance the situation and avoid this tremendous concentration of power with someone who is already demonstrating his, 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 uh, his uh, hidden autocrat has come to the fore in all full, um, the emperor has no clothes. The autocrat has no clothes in the midst of, uh, of this pandemic. We don't see that from the PAN. We see some, perhaps, some meager voices from, from the PRI 
there's been more leaders of civil society like Mexicanos contra la corrupción and the great work that uh, Claudio X Gonzalez is is doing there or or, or uh, Valeria Moy of uh, of Mexico como vamos uh, it's been these 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 very loud voices more from civil society in in letting us know what is going to happen and to watch out rather than from the political establishment. And I fear that that has to do a great deal with the own political infighting. I would keep my eye on two, uh, two, two uh, figures here. Enrique de la Madrid from, from the PRI. I, I, I think he's a, a voice of credibility and, 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 and humility, and he's got uh, quite a head on his shoulders. And also Juan Carlos Romero Hicks uh, from, from the PAN. Uh, he seems to be the one that tries to take a stand. But galvanize a movement, I don't see it yet, John. Thank you. Uh, Sergio, thank you for waiting patiently. Um, you pointed out Duque uh, enjoys um, higher public support today uh, than before the pandemic. But he still has to govern over a uh, pretty divided Congress, uh, lots of jealous politicians who don't like the fact that he's gained support. He had a uh, reform agenda um, that he was pursuing before the pandemic. I'd like to understand what's happened to that agenda on the one hand. Secondarily, if, if that agenda is no longer priority, what are the legislative priorities this year? Um, and and you know, what might happen um, in the next election cycle in terms of uh, the opposition. Great. Uh, that's a handful of questions, but I'll do my best to to answer them. Um, I think I think first let's talk about the role that Congress has played, because President Duque did not have a solid majority uh, in Congress since the day he got elected. But some of the initiatives that he's tried to pass through, uh, particularly those that are peace related, have found a brick wall in Congress. Uh, however, those initiatives that he has put forward that are more related to the economy, such as the National Development Plan or the two uh, tax reforms that he, that he passed through, first uh, that needed to be fixed because of a procedural error, and then the second time around uh, he passed through, suggest that Congress is much willing to play ball on the economy, or at least uh, those parties in the center which President Duque desperately needs to fulfill his uh, legislative agenda. As you recall, back in November, we had uh, very large protests in Colombia that President Duque and, and his cabinet very wisely uh, were able to kick the can down the road with a national conversation dynamic. Uh, and he promised to bring up uh, the majority of the results of those conversations um, in the present legislature uh, that, that was supposed to start uh, on M March 16th. Um, those, uh, that legislature was, was uh, kicked one month uh, and actually started on April uh, 13th. And a big part of the problem was that Congress didn't really know uh, how it was supposed to legislate. If it was going to be able to legislate over Zoom, like we're talking right now, if they had to physically attend uh, the, the Congress sessions, the, although the government did put out a decree that allowed them to meet, it didn't specify the legality of the decisions that they came up with. So Congress has been quite a disappointing uh, part of this crisis because instead of legislating, over the issues that are important to Colombians, like force majeure uh, to, to dissolve contracts, like labor issues to be able to give employers uh, a sense of how they should act. Uh, they, 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 they've talked about uh, life sentences for uh, child molestation and promoting the Antioqueño Carriel as a symbol of cultural heritage. And I think, I think this, this shows uh, how, how little uh, the Congress has been willing to move. They also did a law on, um, on, 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 a, on a, a clean slate for uh, indebted people who have been reported to credit rating agencies. Uh, and so I, I think Congress is not really uh, up to the crisis that we're faced with. I think that there are many more present issues that Congress has to 
uh, start legislating on and has to exert their political control powers about. In the meantime, I think President Duque and, 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 and the government have been quite content with continuing issuing decrees. And I think the, the, the biggest part of this problem and is, is that while they keep issuing decrees, the amount of grievances that are going uh, against the government is, is increasing. And so President Duque has been having this 6 p.m. Uh, television show every day where he talks about the state of the country, how COVID-19 is evolving, the state of government measures to address the crisis. Uh, and I think that he's, for now, winning all, all that attention, but the chickens have to come home to roost at some point. And I think many of the grievances, legitimate or not, that many of the opposition has, have, has had before, as well as some of the issues that people with COVID-19 or, 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 or that are suffering from the lockdowns of COVID-19 are gonna have, uh, are going to reemerge uh, at a given point. And I think a, a big part of the problem has been that, that the government has been very unwilling to work, uh, very similar to what Tiago was saying, very unwilling to work uh, with the middle ground parties and with the parties that are not, uh, that, are, that are, have declared themselves independent. And, and, and while uh, the country is, is, is clamoring for some semblance of national unity, uh, the government is, is insisting on aerial fumigation of coca crops. The government is insisting on, and many members of the ruling party have said that this is the perfect time to um, do away with major tenants of the peace agreement. Uh, and President Duque has been spending uh, what some suggest is, is a profligate amount in armored trucks for his personal um, uh, uh, deployments and uh, publicity. So the question is, is, is if the government is taking advantage of the opportunity to rally the country behind a common purpose or not. And I think that there's a lot to say that the government may be squandering an opportunity to give itself uh, a, a place to go uh, for the next two years. I think the, the, the fiscal constraints that Colombia has, and, and I know that uh, former finance minister Mauricio Cardenas, uh, who I don't know if is in this chat or not, uh, but one of the things he has said is that Colombia needs to be much more uh, loose in terms of uh, its, its, its ability to, to perform fiscal stimulus. The problem is the constraints that we have in terms of our fiscal rule, in terms of our credit rating with international agencies, which is still a notch Above, uh, above investment grade. So we're, 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 we're walking a tight rope here. And the question is if the government's going to be ambitious enough to be able to do away with that fiscal rule or try to become much more ambitious in the sense of, of financing, not just the things that are necessary to affect this pandemic, but the things that are necessary to address the next pandemic, which many think is climate change. And in that regard, I think uh, this, is, this is positioning opposition parties uh, who, have, who are going to govern or, or who are going to run with the benefit of hindsight and are going to be armchair epidemiologists about this whole issue and are going to say, if I were president, I would have dealt with this in a different way. And so the, 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 the question is going to be, who is going to take advantage of this crisis and who's going to take advantage of the movements of the governments and of the mistakes that the government is making today. And, and, and the, the problem is uh, populist uh, leaders are very happy letting Duque make mistakes and are writing them down uh, for, for the next right. time around. I wouldn't discount, you know, this giving rise to figures either on the right or on the left. That, that, can, that can take advantage of that. What I will say is that the confrontation between President Duque and Bogota Mayor Claudia Lopez is not helpful to businesses trying to make decisions about whether they should restart uh, operations or not, whether it's safe to fly in staff from abroad or not, whether it's uh, on what conditions and on what terms can they begin this economic reopening uh, to employ people to get 
the economy rolling. Uh, and also, uh, to be fair, the business sector has been pressing President Duque quite a bit to reopen fast, reopen quick. And if that does happen, and then we do get a second wave, then President Duque is certainly going to be to blame uh, for that, which again, will give much more fuel to these opposition. So I have to be very uh, careful because I think the bind that President Duque is under is not easy. And, yeah. and to his credit, he has managed it much better than other leaders would have uh, under the same amount of pressure. Right. No, I think, you know, I think the dynamic in, in Colombia um, is very interesting, in part because you have been successful <clears throat> at, uh, at tapping down the virus. Um, but the downside of that is, the, is that it develops a sense of thinking that if this thing pops up again, you know, it's a disaster. Um, uh, I was part of a webinar not long ago where uh, the governor of Antioquia was on the line and he talked about, well, there's certain municipalities that don't have the virus. So what happens if they open up and the virus gets in there? We have gone so far away from the original healthcare approach of we're gonna bend the curve, not to stop the virus, but to keep it from overwhelming our health systems. To now we have this mentality that we can completely shut it down, like putting out a fire and keep it down until we have a vaccine. And I think that that change in mentality, and it's precisely because of the political risk of opening up and what it does is in terms of backlash against those politicians. It, the politicians, by taking such a strict measure of, of men, philosophy to attacking the virus, puts them in a situation where they're in a corner and they can't come out. Even if there's plenty of evidence to show that you can manage a more open economy with the virus without letting its uh, healthcare system over, uh, be overwhelmed. And that's, that's the political dilemma that I think um, it, three months from now, six months from now, ironically, it may be the Brazils and the, and the Mexicos who actually achieve herd immunization are suffering a disastrous political um, impact today. But six months from now can actually operate a more open economy, whereas the Colombians in the world who kept it tapped down so much, or the New Zealands, which are island economies, kept it tapped, they can't open up because politically it'll be a disaster. So um, we have a lot, of, a lot of good questions from the audience. People are still on the line, but I do want us to go to uh, one poll question before um, uh, we continue to answer more of the audience questions. Uh, for those of you who are on the line, if you could let us know what kind of um, change in your organization's revenue you anticipate this year versus last year because I, I wanna get into uh, some questions around the business environment and what investors can expect. Because what we're walking into here, we're spending all of this money, um, as much as 20% of GDP in some countries. Uh, right now we're well over 10, 12, 13% in countries like Peru, Chile, Brazil, um, but when you, when you combine that with the lack of tax revenue that's coming out of um, a, a stoppage in the economy, you're talking about a massive deficit, fiscal deficit, um, that may or may not be able to be financed in, at, at decent rates uh, as countries lose their investment grade. Um, and unlike the United States or Europe or China, who can print money without having such a devastating impact on their inflation. Countries in Latin America generally don't have that luxury. And so how are they gonna make up for that? And some people are pointing to you know, the need for higher taxes or the need for a totally different uh, um, sort of social welfare system with more direct payment to people. Um, so uh, as we look around, and thank you everyone for answering, uh, we're seeing a certain convergence of somewhere between zero uh, to negative 30% growth is where most companies are anticipating their revenues next year. So my question to, to each of you, could start with you, Tiago. Uh, you advise a lot of companies on the investment climate in Brazil, and I realize it's gonna vary industry by industry. But generally speaking, is Brazil going to be an easier place to do? Now, let's, let's put the pandemic beside. Let's say 18 months from now, 
there's a vaccine, the health scare has been strongly reduced. Um, is Brazil going to be an easier place to do business, a less costly place to do business, or is it going to be a more costly place to do business than it is before the pandemic? Okay. Brazil will be an easier place to do business. Uh, naturally, it depends on the, uh, the type of business in Brazil. We have historically two types of investors in Brazil. We have the investor that uh, more on the short capital individual uh, to come in Brazil because they looked at the interest rates in Brazil and they saw that this was a opportunity. So in 2015, uh, our interest rate was. Tiago, I'm going to stop you there for a second. Uh, right now is around 3%. Tiago, can you hear me? Unfortunately, well, your, your audio is breaking up quite badly. Um, what I'm going to ask is that you um, reconnect back to the webinar. Uh, that should help clear up your, your audio and video. Your video is not working at all, and your audio is very choppy. Uh, if I could ask you to reconnect. In the meantime, Roberto, um, Roberto, I'd like to ask you the same question about Mexico while Tiago reconnects. Put ourselves, you know, 18 months from now, what's the investment climate going to be like in Mexico? Will it be more costly, more complicated? Um, let's assume that the healthcare crisis is behind us. I'm interested in the economic and the regulatory framework in which investors will operate a year and a half, two years from now in Mexico. Well, I think from from uh, just taking into account the COVID factor, I do think that the beginnings of a recovery will probably occur um, probably in the middle towards the latter part of 2021. So that's the conservative scenario that I know some sectors are taking. Others uh, might be better positioned because, uh, as you know, in, on July 1st, USMCA is supposed to kick in. We are still governed by by uh, by by NAFTA um, by the NAFTA normative structure, but um, there's a great opportunity for Mexico in the face of the so-called new deglobalization that is going on, which is really a concern about um, staying closer to home, a concern about the cost of logistics, the cost of transportation, and how to become more competitive in the face of the hard adjustments that we had to take with the, with the pandemic. There's a real opportunity for Mexico to become not just the number one trading partner from, of the United States and of, and of Canada, as it is, it's already a player in, in many other markets in the world, but also be, to become a, a strategic, a fundamentally important strategic hub for uh, a business in North America uh, both as we tackle the challenges of recovery, but also recuperate a, the path towards uh, sustained growth. Uh, companies that will move away from other offshore locations and are going to see Mexico as a, a more reliable uh, partner in this regard. So it behooves the current administration to adjust its policies and to be able to have a more friendly outlook towards the type of investment in infrastructure, in natural gas, certainly in energy, uh, they, they, they would have to shift some 180 degrees, uh, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, I, th there is a great opportunity there to be able to enhance Mexico's competitiveness post-COVID that could give us a very different outlook from perhaps those estimates or guesstimates, as, if you will, that are being put uh, in, uh, um, let's say, in the, in the um, polls that you just uh, shared. Now, in, in, uh, in other sectors, I think there might, be, there, might be, uh, there might be a lot more stress, especially financial stress. Um, cash flow has been hit dramatically. Uh, my main concern is, once again, is if the AMLO administration continues to stick to a very intolerant disposition and not wanting, for instance, to revise its premises on whether it should continue the Dos Bocas investment, the, 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 uh, the investment in the refinery with a collapse of petroleum prices, it doesn't seem to be reasonable to suggest that we should be expanding capacity right now when the rest of the world is doing exactly the opposite in the face of these shifts in demand. 
and this anillo al dedo and this and, and this premise that I'm going to stick to my stick to my agenda no matter what come what may, I I I think that will be much more influential as far as a factor in how how quickly we can we can uh, mitigate the downturn than the actual uh, emergence from the COVID uh, pandemic. That's the big question to see in 2021. Great, thank you, Roberto. Tiago, um, I, I, I think uh, you've successfully reconnected. Please, I'd uh, love to hear your thoughts on uh, future business environment in Brazil. Well, yes, uh, good to be back. Um, I see that, uh, as I was explaining, historically we had two types of investors in Brazil. One focused more on, on speculative capital. It was one that was looking more at short terms. And the interest rates in Brazil was always very attractive for this type of investor. So in 2015, uh, we had 14% interest rate versus the 3% that we have today. However, uh, when we look today, the productive capital or the more longer term capital, they look at Brazil with more interest for two reasons. First, the, the long-term interest rate still looks something uh, positive for them. It still looks as an opportunity. And at the same time, the exchange rate makes Brazil very cheap. However, the questions that I listen more from, from my clients are related to two issues. First, the methodology of the central bank in order to control the exchange rate, in order to avoid it spiraling out of control. How effective is that? The answer right now is that it is relatively efficient because as I was talking this week with uh, the, the pre president of the Brazilian Central Bank, um, the expectation is that uh, they will do whatever is necessary, uh, most, mostly through swaps, to avoid uh, the currency to go over 6 or 620 or something like that. At the same time, there is a major pressure from the agricultural sector and we, have, we don't need to remind everyone of how important commodities are for Brazil, for the exchange rate not to drop very much. So it is a, a number that maintaining relatively high is good for Brazilian exports, and also at the same time, it makes cheap for uh, long-term investments in Brazil. However, the number one doubt is about the government, because the government is a prolific producer of uncertainties. And as what I listen mostly from my clients is that they don't care at the end of the day if the government will generate good or bad news. Because good news, they will take advantage of it and bad news, they will protect themselves from it. The uncertainty is what kills the possibility of investment because uncertainty prevents them from understanding what will happen in the short term. And this right now is the biggest concern for, for the investor. In terms of the reforms, the expectation for the uh, approval of structural reforms next year is relatively good, but it depends once again on the political stability and the capacity of the government to sustain the alliance that I mentioned before with the centrist parties. At the same time, we're going to see a government that probably will have more willingness to spend money rather than the austerity behavior that we saw uh, from Paulo Guedes in this first uh, year of administration. So the subsidized credit from uh, state-owned banks could be a reality. We could see again BNDS playing a potential role in stimulating companies uh, in order to, to grow and recover. Uh, fiscal incentives is also a possibility that the ministerial uh, economic team are working with it. And uh, of course, access to credit. Brazil has immense uh, foreign reserves, over $400 billion. Right now, the idea is not to use those reserves because of confidence issue. Uh, however, uh, they are there and they still give discussion of confidence for the uh, investor when it comes to Brazil because they see no risk of, um, not, uh, of an economic meltdown. So, Today, the number one question in terms of confidence in investing in Brazil still comes from political stability. Um, quick follow-up, Tiago. One of the questions from, um, from our attendees. Uh, the replacement of the Minister of Justice. Um, who is the new minister? What is that minister's position uh, in terms of uh, the Lava Jato investigation? Um, what does... Uh, 
you know, will this minister maintain those investigations? Uh, will Bolsonaro be able to continue to interfere uh, as he was accused of by uh, Moro? Um, and what does this mean for the, uh, the, the business community in Brazil and its ability to um, operate? Well, first of all, um, and, and this is something that not very, uh, lots of people are fully aware, the, the inter, there is uh, the, the investigations of the car wash or anything like that are not conducted by the Ministry of Justice. In fact, the Ministry of Justice have no uh, access to that whatsoever. It's uh, the, the judicial system in Brazil, uh, we can question its quality, but we cannot question its independence. So uh, the, the car wash operation is conducted by independent investigations, which are focused mainly in the state of Paraná in the city of Curitiba. However, the car wash operation is an operation that relied heavily on plea bargains in a very similar technique that we saw on uh, Operation Clean Hands in Italy. In fact, Moro is one of the biggest Brazilian specialists in the Operation Clean Hands from Italy, where he emulated several of the behaviors and actions that he saw there. So the, the plea bargain sequence in Brazil comes to a point for the Operation Car Wash that starts coming back on itself, uh, to a point that no new fact emerges from that. So I don't see that the Operation Car Wash can review anything much bigger than what it already reviewed because the, the collection of proofs and evidence comes from the plea bargains and it basically fulfilled several circles uh, of one individual pointing out to another or an, a company pointing out to another that it won't leave this uh, circuit that we already saw. The Ministry of Justice, basically, uh, they have the administrative leadership over the federal police, which is the Brazilian equivalent from the FBI. However, the, they cannot interfere on the actions of the federal police. So a group of individuals inside the federal police, they have the autonomy to investigate an investigation as they want at any time against anyone. And the Minister of Justice, he has to be informed but he cannot intervene, block, interrupt, or even change the individuals who are currently at the core. He can change naturally the director of the federal police, but the, the Brazilian federal police, I would say that is probably one of the most respected organs in the Brazilian uh, administration. Just for an, for an example, for you to become a federal policeman in Brazil, you must have a law degree. So the, the levels of, of uh, policemen that occupies this force are very, very high. So Andre Mendonça, the new Minister of Justice, he is an individual that is very aligned with Bolsonaro. He will look, for example, the national security force uh, that can uh, use operations by request of governors to intervene on very heavy secure operations and security issues in particular uh, places. However, he cannot decide the fate of certain investigations because this is not the competence of the Ministry of uh, Justice. Uh, if we make an exercise of possibilities, in theory, the worst case thing, the scenario, or the worst action that the Ministry of Justice could do is basically leak information to the president. And this naturally is a risk. This naturally is one of the questionings that several individuals made when he appointed someone so close to him. But this is something that it's still in the realm of absolute speculation because we have seen no evidence or anything in this sense. So shifting the control of the Ministry of Justice is something more symbolic and internal to the government than actual uh, changes in public policies. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, in Colombia, um, you know, Colombia is being hit from a fiscal point of view, not only by COVID and the inability to collect taxes through sales tax, et cetera, but of course, the collapse of oil prices. Uh, we learned back in 2015 just how vulnerable Colombia's exchange rate, Colombia's fiscal balance uh, relies upon oil. I, that's always the case, and that's been the case in Mexico for a long time. But 
Um, I think it, it's, it's, it's putting, it's painting Colombia into a real corner, just like Mexico. Um, uh, so how, you know, how will Colombia, which is proudly holding on by its fingernails to its investment grade status, how will, uh, what will this mean to the, what is already considered by most to be a pretty burdensome tax system on business? How are they going to, what is that business climate going to look like? What's that tax environment going to look like a year and a half from now in, in Colombia? Yeah, John, thanks uh, for that question. I, I think, you know, President Duque, when he passed the tax reform in 2019, uh, it lowered taxes significantly for companies, but the majority of the tax breaks included in that law we're gonna kick in in 2021. Uh, I don't think the government is planning on, on changing that because uh, the majority of its business friendly credentials come from its, 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 its forward looking tax um, policies. But I do think that Colombia does have a revenue problem and the majority of taxes are not collected from individuals like in OECD countries, but from uh, companies. And so I think that one of the things that this government has been do doing uh, so far, they, they, when, when the first tax proposal was, was put forward by the government, uh, an increase of value added taxes was suggested and particularly value added taxes to um, general goods and services for private consumption. And this enraged a lot of people, although the government had said that they would uh, affect uh, a, a tax reimbursement to the, the two lowest uh, quintiles of the population. At the moment that the government did not have credibility to do that, uh, but now the government is, is about to um, issue its second disbursement of tax refunds for those two lower quintiles of the population. So now the government does have credibility uh, when, it, when it says that it's going to return these taxes to the population, which to me suggests that the government before the end of the year might draw up a new tax reform to do just that, to increase revenues coming from individuals and to maintain its tax uh, incentives for, for, for corporations. I want to point out that, you know, like this survey that you conducted at the beginning of this uh, poll, uh, Colombia is expected to do the best I would suggest that Colombia is expected to do the least worst uh, of, of, of uh, all the countries in Latin America. But that in and of itself should already suggest to international companies and international businesses that Colombia does have an attractive and is an attractive place to invest. The problem is whether that investment comes from the traditional sources, oil, gas and mining, or if Colombia is able to diversify towards other sources of investments. And I think that the, the, the jury is still out on, on Colombia's ability to attract uh, and to diversify its, its, its uh, foreign direct investment sources into things like FinTech, into things like healthcare services, into something that somebody mentioned uh, in the questions, which is uh, value chain diversification and if Colombia is able to attract foreign capital in that sense. I think Colombia is well positioned to do so. And, and, and I really hope that, uh, that the country and that international investors uh, also take note of that. Great, look, um, we're drawing close. I wanna ask one more question of each of you uh, because we've already gone 30 minutes over our time and um, we still have uh, close to 200 people listening. Um, there's been some fabulous questions that have been posted. I don't believe we'll be able to address them all, but let me ask each of our panel to um, answer this question. Um, you all deal with different sectors and investors looking, and there are certainly some opportunistic uh, investors who've been through the ups and downs of Latin America in the past and tend to uh, find opportunity in these times of crisis. Uh, without naming names of clients, uh, tell us which industries are you receiving um, 
interest from. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll finish with what we're seeing at our firm, but I'd love to hear from each of you and maybe it will be a reflection of where uh, there's opportunities for investment right now in your countries. Uh, Tiago, do you want to start us off? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the telecom sector is one that has been very intense in talking uh, with me. We're going to have uh, in the beginning of next year, the largest 5G bidding process in the world. And uh, this also brings a, a major ge a geopolitical element to it because Huawei will participate in the competition alongside Nokia from Finland and Ericsson from Sweden. Uh, so this will be something big and this is already attracting the attention of several companies uh, in the entire chain a telecom chain because of the investments being made. Also infrastructure is a major thing. And uh, the sewage system, uh, there is this uh, project which will go forward probably this year about the privatization of the sewage system in Brazil. And this is a major, major uh, issue of attractiveness for investors because uh, we still have 40% to reach in terms of fulfilling a, a universal sewage system. So once we fulfill that, it's a service that the companies will make money in a never ending way because people will not stop to use it or cease to use it. So uh, it is seen as a major opportunity. And also when they look at the bargains, several companies that are sound economic, that they have a cash flow, that they have uh, the projective uh, demand in, from their customers, but right now, because of the coronavirus, they're suffering it, uh, with it. And also, given the exchange rates, they're becoming cheaper. So there are several, several funds uh, looking and, and asking for lists of companies per sector in which they can buy a stake of it. And I think we're probably in about three, four months, Brazil will be a very large shopping mall uh, to the most aggressive investor and depending on politics to the most uh, uh, cautious investor as well. Great, thank you. Um, Roberto, in Mexico, what, uh, what are you, for those opportunistic investors, where are they looking? You're on mute, I believe, Roberto. Yeah, bad habit. I apologize. <laughs> um, where are they looking again? If the policy framework is right and if the signals are right, I would have thought that uh, green energies and renewable energies, especially given the 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 um, the, the need for lower for long term lower electricity uh, prices, <clears throat> and especially in view of the commitments on the part of several uh, private companies, private, private investors that were not asking for one single cent of subsidy. All they were doing is asking for the opportunity and the help from, from local governments, uh, especially in the North where there's a very pro entrepreneurial mentality, um, facilidades para el trabajo, so to speak. And so make my life easy from a regulatory standpoint and whatnot. That would have been a very important sector. I still believe that 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 um, that uh, renewables and also natural gas. Uh, that's another story altogether. But uh, th those represent uh, an area of uh, opportunity for long-term investment in the future, given or assuming that Mexico will once again reintegrate it and become an integral part of the North American uh, economy. And, and, and that will be a fundamental driver of, uh, of um, real cost reduction, of what economists call real cost reduction, which is the true source of competitiveness. It's not uh, macroeconomic uh, manipulation or, or whatnot. Another area where I see a great deal of interest right now is in uh, digital education. Even the, I think I mentioned this before in another webinar, but e even the Ministry of Education here in Mexico is beginning to explore different platforms, given that despite the fact that schools were supposed to go back on the 1st of, of, um, of June, uh, that is now completely unlikely. And in fact, many private uh, schools 
uh, and the public system itself are preparing for the fact that we may have to write it out all of 2020 and not go back to a classroom physically until 2021. So that disruption is, is more akin to a, a creative destruction that Schumpeter would have called. There's an area of opportunity where the service providers and, and those that develop or are able to import or are able to construct the technologies for this, let's remember that uh, Mexico has developed its own Silicon Valley in, in, uh, in the state of Jalisco, uh, a now world-renowned uh, um, region for technological development, for development of new technologies. So e-education, e e e-commerce, of course, is also another one where, uh, because of these changes, uh, we're beginning to see uh, very, very important investments in, in that regard. But the most important, in my opinion, is what specialists call midstream. In other words, um, uh, storage and transportation. Uh, that infrastructure seems to me the greatest uh, um, investment opportunity for Mexico, assuming that with or without COVID or with, a, with or without AMLO's caprices, the, the, just the pure inertia of North American integration and Mexico's place in global trade as one of the top 10 uh, trading nations in the world, the fact that it's no longer a commodity-based economy, but a highly diversified, even service-oriented and manufacturing-oriented economy, I believe that that there's a great area of opportunity where all of a sudden people are waking up and saying, hey, this is where I need to go, and this is where at least uh, certainly people in energy are looking much more at midstream than, for instance, service stations or 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 uh, or other parts of that productive chain, but it's not just energy, it's, it's, um, it's all over. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the role of NAFTA um, or USMCA will be instrumental in, in bringing uh, Mexico out of this economic downturn. Uh, Sergio, in, in, uh, in Colombia, uh, where are investors seeking, seeking opportunity right now? So I think uh, the tech and innovation sector uh, Colombia has wanted to become the Silicon Valley of Latin America, and I think President Duque has has brought attention to the sector. Um, and I think Medellin is growing quite significantly in terms of investment that's allocated there. I think, similar to Tiago, infrastructure continues to be one of Colombia's main competitivity uh, setbacks, and I think the government is is aware of this and will uh, attempt to do that. Everything that has to do with green growth um, in, in terms of energy, in terms of fighting deforestation, I think has great potential in, in Colombia and I think investors are looking at that. But also, and I'm gonna say something that sounds contradictory, uh, I think Colombia has uh, four and a half more years of oil production to meet demand. Uh, and I think that assets right now in that sector are quite cheap. And so uh, I, I wouldn't discard investors looking at potential uh, M&As with certain oil companies uh, that are, are, are going through a struggle right now. But it all depends on the government's willingness to talk about the things that uh, pre present also competitive hamstrings for that sector, such as transportation costs. Finally, I think mining uh, has a huge potential in Colombia, particularly this year when uh, the Buritica project comes online and perhaps other projects could be given their environmental license like Soto Norte uh, and Gramalote could also start up and the co copper mine in Jericó could also open a, a new possibility for Colombia. So I think mining isn't discarded. Uh, and oil isn't discarded in its entirety, but Colombia is looking for uh, green growth and tech investments. Great, thank you. Um, I know at AMI, we've received a lot of interest around e-commerce. Um, we've, we've done a couple of webinars on it. Um, we've put together a report that is being widely purchased uh, that forecast e-commerce numbers. Um, three of our practices intersect around e-commerce, uh, our payments practice, our logistics practice, and our consumer services practice. And um, for payments companies, it's very interesting because people are eschewing uh, cash 
and want to buy digitally, it's safer to do so. And of course, um, uh, there's something like 20 million new e-commerce customers in Latin America, according to a, uh, a visa report out yesterday. And that's just visa. So visa's got uh, probably 60% market share. So let's call it 30 million new e-commerce customers across Latin America that have come on board uh, through COVID. Another area I would agree with you, Sergio, is mining, particularly gold mining. Um, you know, the price of gold is back near record high. And uh, energy tends to be about 30% of their cost, operational, operational cost. So you're going to see uh, gold mining companies um, looking very favorable as uh, vehicles to receive uh, investment monies. And that's going to help expand their um, expansion into the region. Colombia, of course, is an important uh, gold deposit area, as well as more traditional ones like uh, Peru and Brazil, um, but also Ecuador, the DR, et cetera. In fact, I would say it's gold and barracks project in the DR that's keeping that government afloat because tourism has collapsed. Um, healthcare, of course, um, a lot of interest tends to be opportunistic around the sale of specific equipment, uh, specific devices. Um, another really interesting area, uh, again, going uh, echoing what Tiago and Sergio said, is infrastructure. The big players, the people who can think long term, the pension funds. Uh, the large operators who have strong um, balance sheets right now, uh, they, you know, they like to invest in infrastructure in downtimes when currencies are weak because most of these projects rely on local currency revenue intake. And so investing when uh, currencies are weak, when governments are anxious to attract investors is the optimal time. And if you're taking a 20-year uh, investment position in an infrastructure play, the timing of your entry has a massive impact on the uh, return on investment. And so um, the, you know, the big global players are definitely interested in infrastructure right now. Um, logistics last mile, again, related to e-commerce is huge. And uh, I would echo what Roberto said on online education. Um, most universities in Latin America on the private side have dabbled with online education, usually in some sort of um, uh, association or collaboration with an international university. Um, but now they have to really push forward and perhaps offer all of their classes online or a much more of a hybrid. Um, and then what has not really moved forward at all in Latin America is uh, K to 12 public education. Um, and, and that suddenly needs to be uh, in parts of the, the region will need to go online. And that's, that's a real challenge um, that, that different players are scrambling to, to provide. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all three of our panelists, uh, as well as, as Abel, who helps put these webinars together and, and keep them flowing. I want to thank our audience. Um, a couple of people in the audience said, why aren't we dealing with other countries in Latin America. Well, as you can see by just the robustness of the responses provided by three panelists, we barely scratched the surface in, in Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia. Uh, there's 21 countries in Latin America. Um, it's just uh, it's a matter of time management. At some point, we may need to do country by country webinars to really dig deep. But thank you to everyone who tuned in for your excellent questions. Uh, and we look forward to your uh, replies. We put up everyone's email here on this last page. Feel free to reach out to us uh, and ask those questions, and we'll be happy to follow up with all of you. Thank you again for your time today, and look forward to hearing from you in future. Thank you.